greetings from the end of the world. No, I'm just kidding you guys. But I wanted to do a video today, probably do these every day, talking about what I'm thinking about with regard to coronavirus. And if it's helpful, I'll keep doing them. I actually don't think it's the end of the world at all. And I'll talk about why and what I'm doing to think about coronavirus and some new developments regarding chloroquine. Talk about that a little bit. And we'll all just hang out for a little while on Instagram. So here we go. So a couple of interesting things that I've been watching over the last few days. I'll do a screen share here and hopefully this will work just fine. The first of those is that um, one of my friends sent me an article today that a 103-year-old uh, beat the coronavirus. So I think this is a really interesting testament perhaps to the importance of underlying health and the way that pre-existing conditions can be very damaging for humans. So we don't know all of the details about this 103-year-old in Iran who beat the coronavirus, but um, she recovered completely. And there's a couple of other cases of people who are centenarians also recovering from the coronavirus. I would love to see data on this person's history, whether they have any pre-existing conditions or whether they're just a really healthy, spry 103-year-old, but it raises the idea, as they say in the subheading, that the deadly virus poses more risk for elderly and those with pre-existing health conditions. I talked about this in the um, podcast I did earlier this week. If you guys want to see that, I went into that in detail. So I want to show you guys something else that I check pretty much every day for the coronavirus. You don't have to check this unless you're interested in this like me. This is a website, uh, coronavirus.1.3acres.com. And you can see the number of new cases of coronavirus every day. You can see sort of how we are trending in the United States. So you can see that on the 18th, there were 27 or 2,975 cases. On the 19th, which was yesterday, there were 4,949 cases. And that so far today, there are 4,497 cases reported. So I expect that number to be higher by the end of the day today. But what we will see when we get this under control is that these numbers will start to level off. You can show this in a regular or a logarithmic graph if you are uh, mathematically inclined, whichever one looks better to you. You can also see the total and the cumulative number of deaths here, or you can look at the infection rate in Canada, which is uh, looking a little bit more uh, subdued than ours to tell you the truth in terms of these number of new cases. The thing I am looking at every day is generally how many new cases. So this blue line down here, how many new cases are happening every day, we basically want to see that starting to level off and then we will have some sense that basically the infection is starting to flatten and that we are in a better place with regard to coronavirus. One thing that's been talked about a lot, I did not talk about this on the podcast, but I wanted to talk about it now, is the use of chloroquine for coronavirus. And this is an interesting idea that we can um, discuss here. And I pulled up some articles that I want to share with you guys. Let me pull those up. So the first of these is actually an article from 2005, and it was August 2005. This is done with SARS-CoV-1, which is the SARS infection, but it showed that, the, that chloroquine was a potent inhibitor of the SARS coronavirus infection and spread. This was done in cell culture. They used primate cell culture. And interestingly, as I'll show you here with some of these results, the inhibitory effects were observed when cells were treated with the drug either before or after exposure to the virus, suggesting both prophylactic and therapeutic advantage. This is quite interesting because the possibility then becomes that we could use chloroquine at, or as I will show you in a moment, hydroxychloroquine for people who are infected with coronavirus and get severe symptoms. As we saw with the 103 year old from Iran who recovered, uh, certainly not everyone who gets coronavirus probably needs to get chloroquine, but we can use it, uh, or at least these studies might suggest that we could use it for people who are having more severe reactions. So back to this study, um, you can see here that they suggest some mechanisms here which are interesting and kind of academic in nature. Um, in addition to well-known functions of chloroquine, such as elevations of endosomal pH, which are the lysosomes, these sort of vesicles in the cells where the virus is being processed. If you listen to the podcast I did earlier this week, I talked about how the virus enters our cells, how it is then 
using our machinery to make its genetic machinery, make its genetic material. That genetic material then is making proteins which encapsulate into new viruses. And then there are endosomes and lysosomes and endolysosomes, these cellular vesicles in which the virus is essentially assembled and exported out of the cell. And if you raise the pH of those endosomes, it appears that perhaps the virus is unable to do its work of reassembly and is less effective in our cells. So that may be one of the mechanisms by which chloroquine is working. The other one, as they talk about in this uh, paper, are that chloroquine appears to interfere with terminal glycosylation of the cellular receptor angiotensin converting enzyme 2. I talked about ACE2 as well in the first podcast I did earlier this week. What we know is that coronaviruses in general, including this coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, use the ACE2 receptor to enter our cells. And so if we could potentially block that or decrease the effectiveness by which coronavirus can bind to ACE2, we could inhibit viral entry into cells. And one of the things that is suggested for coronavirus is that it may indeed uh, be, um, or suggested for chloroquine, is that it may be affecting the way that these angiotensin converting to uh, angiotensin converting enzyme to cellular receptors are glycosylated, which the, is the addition of a sugar group to the receptor, and that may inhibit viral attachment and entry into the cell. So I just want to show you how they did these experiments, but their conclusion was this may negatively influence virus receptor binding and abrogate the infection. I love that word, abrogate, uh, with further ramifications by the elevation of acicular pH resulting in the inhibition and infection and spread of SARS-CoV at clinical admissible concentrations. Again, this is a 2005 paper. I'm gonna go over a 2020 paper which used SARS-CoV-2, but this was done with SARS-CoV-1 in 2005. So this is not quite the same virus, but it's probably uh, analogous or um, similar in the way that it's going to uh, react to these interventions. So you can see here, this graph is more interesting because these are looking at post-infection chloroquine treatment reducing SARS-CoV infection and spread. This is immunofluorescence of viral antigens showing you that at these different concentrations, 0.1, 1, 10, 33, and 100 micromolar, you can see untreated is having lots of immunofluorescence showing lots of virus. And as you go up, there is much less virus. They are showing you here graphically the percent inhibition of viral replication at various doses of chloroquine on the y-axis, and here they are graphing it uh, a little more differently, showing the uh, percent inhibition uh, as you increase the chloroquine dose in terms of cellular replication of the SARS-CoV virus. So that is pretty interesting to see that. Later on in the paper, they go into some further assays suggesting that the terminal glycosylation, the addition of the sugar unit to the ACE2 uh, transmembrane receptor, or the ACE2 cellular receptor, I should say, is inhibited partially by chloroquine. So that is an interesting thing to look at in terms of how chloroquine might work for this virus. I want to show you guys another newer paper, um, which was done with, uh, so this was actually done, same paper, There we go, hydroxychloroquine. So this is actually from 2020, and this was done with SARS-CoV-2. Um, fascinating here that hydroxychloroquine, a less toxic derivative of chloroquine, is effective in inhibiting SARS-CoV-2 in vitro. So this is really interesting. Again, this is in vitro, again, with, uh, I believe, primate cell culture. One of the things they note here is that hydroxychloroquine is about 40% uh, less toxic then chloroquine in animals. I'm going to go over some of the side effects of chloroquine at the end of this video, but they tested the antiviral effects of hydroxychloroquine against SARS-CoV-2 in comparison to chloroquine, and this is in vitro. Um, all of these studies are in vitro, and again, these are kidney Vero E6 cell culture cells, which are primate cells, I believe. You can see here the same sort of graphs um, looking at percent inhibition of viral replication of chloroquine versus hydroxychloroquine, and the, they perform similarly. The pink line is hydroxychloroquine, the blue line is chloroquine. So this is another uh, 
uh, paper that is suggesting that both hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine could be effective in inhibiting viral replication and processing. This is kind of a neat graphic if you're super nerdy and you want to look at this. These are the endolysosomes and the lysosomes, uh, the, and they are showing in this uh, sort of immunofluorescent assay how they get bigger and they don't seem to form properly and the viral particles are uh, isolated around the outside of the vesicles when they are using hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. And you can see untreated, these vesicles look very different. They're showing you an endolysosome or an end uh, uh, or a, uh, a lysosome here, and they're showing you how different these look with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Again, kind of geeky stuff. I'm sure you guys love it, but as they're saying, showing here, abnormally enlarged uh, endolysosomes and end, uh, endosomes. So early endosomes and endolysosomes were enlarged with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. This is crucial since acidification is crucial for endosome maturation and function, we surmise that endosome maturation might be blocked at intermediate stages of endocytosis, resulting in failure of further transport of virions, virions to the ultimate releasing site. So today we have learned virions and we have also learned abrogate. These are some of my favorite words. We have seen that. So this is really interesting. This again is a 2020 paper with SARS-CoV-2. They suggest that in cell culture, hydroxychloroquine may be efficient at inhibiting SARS-CoV-2. So pretty interesting stuff there um, in light of the way the infection is progressing now. Again, we can look at all of these things and get a sense of how the infection is progressing day to day and what kind of things we might need to be thinking about as we move forward. But there certainly appear to be some therapies that may be effective. And um, then the question becomes, what are the side effects? Like what is the risk versus benefit? Just like all of the other stuff you guys have heard me talk about with regard to plant molecules, we have to think about the package insert for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And there's a couple of papers I pulled up here. I'll show you guys on this stuff. So that's the wrong one. Let's go to this paper here. Sorry guys, this is how it works with Zoom. It's always tricky juggling. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine side effect profile of important therapeutic drugs. You can see here that um, retinopathy is a common side effect of these. You can avoid it by um, using a certain maximum dosage based on the body weight. There are other side effects including uh, skin uh, problem problems, hyperpigmentation, uh, photodynamic reactions, hair changes um, in red-haired men, so gingers beware, uh, chloroquine deposits in the cornea, disturbances of accommodation of the eye, retinopathy, uh, neuromyopathy, and central nervous system disturbances are possibilities as, where, as well as impairment in auditory function or blood cell uh, formation. Um, there's a risk of damage to the fetus if someone is pregnant, uh, hearing loss, loss of the fetus, or otherwise Acute overdose is extremely dangerous for both of these, though, um, and doses are um, possible to obtain. So the, um, the therapeutic index, the therapeutic window for these drugs is fairly small, which is part of the cause for concern. You can see the lethal, lethal dose for um, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine is about four grams for adults. And as you can see in some of these other papers, which are coming out of China, expert consensus on chloroquine phosphate for the treatment of novel coronavirus pneumonia. They are recommending 500 milligrams twice a day per 10 days, diagnosed as mild, moderate, or severe cases of novel coronavirus um, without contraindications to chloroquine like we talked about previously. So that's, I mean, that's a gram of chloroquine per day and four grams can be toxic. Again, risk versus benefit. You can see the paper here for this one. There's another one. A number of these papers are coming out. Um, they say breakthrough chloroquine phosphate shown apparent efficacy in the treatment of COVID-19 uh, associated pneumonia in clinical studies. So these are clinical studies to uh, substantiate many of those in vitro studies that I was mentioning earlier with regard to the primate cells and the use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. One more thing here, this is side effects of chloroquine and primaquine and symptom reduction in a malaria epidemic or endemic area. Again, these drugs are used for malaria and other infections traditionally. Um, most frequent symptoms before medication 
uh, or headache, fever, chills, sweating, arthralgia, back pain, weakness, present in 40 to 76 of respondents. Um, the treatment reduced the occurrence of these symptoms and reduced the lack of appetite, but gastrointestinal symptoms and uh, choleuria increased in frequency. So they're going to say, I think these are the symptoms of malaria up here and the uh, blurred vision, itching, uh, neurological paresthesia, insomnia, stings in the skin were reported after chloroquine was taken. So you can see that there's, these are malaria symptoms and then these are side effects of chloroquine here. So basically the take home here is that in both cell culture studies in primates for SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, both chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine looked like they could be effective for this. So we'll see how it all plays out. And just interesting to talk about this. Um, I think these are going to be used much more in the coming days. Um, and I know Trump has asked the FDA to consider this. I'm pretty sure they're going to do this because they're going to need something to treat these people who have severe infections. So just to know about the side effects, Instagram is not the place to give medical advice. In my opinion, I would not be taking chloroquine prophylactically. It has too many side effects. We'll see how this all plays out. Again, this is totally new stuff. We're trying to figure it out every day. This is just my opinion. I am not an infectious disease specialist. Uh, I'm just a doctor who is interested in this and is sharing my opinion. So take it for what it's worth, you guys. But remember that there was a 103-year-old woman in Iran who got better <laughs> from coronavirus. So I suspect she probably was pretty healthy otherwise. I want to take heart from that. You can use that other coronavirus website that I showed at the beginning to see how the new cases are progressing. Hope you guys are all staying healthy and happy and not getting too crazy in the midst of this social isolation. But hopefully some of this is helpful with regard to what is happening with chloroquine and can inform you. My impression, which is, again, my opinion, it means nothing other than my opinion to share information on Instagram, is that we will probably see chloroquine and the less toxic version, hydroxychloroquine, used potentially widely in the next week to treat severe cases of this, this infection. I would not use it um, in a prophylactic fashion, but it may be something that begins to be discussed. Again, there are many side effects here, but I think for the people who are most affected by this illness, it may be a great intervention as a possibility. So hopefully this helps. Wanted to put it out there. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Stay radical.